So I think we can we can really start. Uh, thanks, uh, many thanks to all uh, the many participants that showed uh, interest in this class. I simply would like uh, to say uh, j just a few words, uh, leaving immediately the, the the stage, the floor to to Marco. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, the 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 willingness of Marco Malvaldi to to give this class. I know it's uh, quite uh, a, an effort to, to prepare on a, a series of lectures like this on a, on a very, uh, let's say, magmatic uh, uh, topic like causality. But I really thought uh, it, is it was important now to devote uh, a part of everybody's, especially in data science PhD, but in general in uh, AI, computer science, and any, any let's say, nick boring field, it's really important that we have a deep understanding of how the, the reasoning about ca causality has developed in the course of the uh, scientific uh, progress in the, in the last centuries, but also how it is becoming today to a new, uh, let's say, phase transition in some sense, uh, new possibilities for for developing uh, uh, better ways to reason about uh, causes and effects. And the teacher that we have for this is uh, Marco Malbaldi. And Mar Marco is really a very special person to do that. Uh, Marco is uh, many, uh, many things together. <laughs> he is a very well-known uh, uh, Italian novelist, uh, very renowned for, for his uh, unforgettable uh, novels. Uh, around uh, many uh, characters that ve are very much part of the contemporary Italian culture and have also been uh, quite extensively uh, not only uh, read in his books, but also uh, seen uh, in, in, TV, in TV uh, that actually uh, in, in, in a, a TV production that also Marco helped to, help to shape out of his novels. But Marco is also a scientist. That's the other, the other side of the story. Marco is a, is a, a, PhD, a PhD in chemistry and an active researcher for, for a long time now in different, in different areas, not only, not only uh, let's say, his main subject around chemistry and physical chemistry, but also on uh, mathematics uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the application of statistical reasoning in, in many different areas. And uh, uh, the reason why is, uh, in, in my opinion, so uh, perfectly shaped in, in uh, uh, talking about causality is that Marco is a fantastic uh, science uh, po po popularization writer. He has uh, produced already a series of uh, uh, divulgation books on different subjects, including uh, natural language uh, and emotions, including uh, uh, mathematics, uh, and recently about causality uh, and, and, and uh, causality reasoning. It's a book uh, in Italian, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's a very precious little book that uh, gives uh, a intuitive account of uh, what are the key ideas that we are reasoning about. And, and I believe uh, the course is also very timely because never, uh, I believe, like in this uh, one and a half year of, of pandemic, we've been continuously re reasoning on causes and, and uh, potential effect. What is the causes of what? Uh, we, we continuously hear uh, causal questions in TV uh, news, uh, in, in, in newspapers, everywhere, we are now faced with the causal questions. And, and clearly, not only in science, but also in, uh, let's say, in, in the public discourse, we, it's really important that we become more and more uh, uh, aware of uh, how reasoning about causes and effects is a, is a tough job. It's the, the typical question that we ask, but it's also the most difficult questions, question that we can ask. And therefore, uh, it, it is very important that if you review in deep what, are the, what, what is the current 
state of the art, what is the cutting edge of the uh, uh, research in this area. But I don't want to say anymore. The, the floor is actually for Marco. Let me really thank Marco for, for taking this, uh, this challenge. And uh, yes, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Dino. Uh, thanks to everyone. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll start by in speaking about causality and we will do it uh, in a gentle way. We will start softly by understanding why uh, we need causality. And of course, the question and the sentence why we need causality is self-consistent. And then we will uh, gradually uh, go deeper, dig into the uh, into the method, and uh, uh, in a philosophical sense, from Hume we will go to Leibniz. From asking ourselves what is causality, we will dive into: Can I calculate how much is the effect of this on that? Can I calculate if? X does cause Y and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, let, let me uh, begin. Uh, let me begin by, uh, by just um, introduce you with this, uh, with this uh, philosophical and mathematical uh, uh, method and, uh, and this kind of problems. Of course, uh, um, at the very moment in which you have some question, uh, some or some other, uh, some other um, uh, problem or, or you want to, to, to comment, please let me know by the, by, by the chat and by the question and answer and we will deal with it. Uh, so uh, we will start. Uh, fortunately, we will, we will start in the 4th of May, that is, uh, of course, the Star Wars Day, and this is uh, just a mere coincidence, but I, 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 I like to, to insert this into the, into the lecture. So, why do we need causality? Let's start, and let's start with uh, asking ourselves, who is the best goalkeeper can you uh, uh, i hope this is this is going uh, this is going well i hope that everyone everyone can see the screen but uh, yes, yes we do we do marco okay perfect so we have uh, a table of uh, two goalkeepers the the goalkeeper a is uh, we call it aristoteles and the goalkeeper b we call him Breras, and we face them with a different number of uh, of uh, uh, penalty kicks. Some of the penalty kicks will be shot by uh, left foot, and some other uh, penalty shots will be shot by the left, by the right foot. So a penalty kick can be shot by the right foot or by the left foot, and. Uh, um, as uh, Gianni Brera, um, a, very, a renowned sport writer in, uh, in Italian, used to say 50 years ago, only once I saw a, um, a, um, a player shooting a penalty kick by head and we were both drunk. So usually a free kick is shot by... Mm, by left or by right foot. So let's try to evaluate the performance of these two goalkeepers. Goalkeeper A, when he's faced with a left shooter, uh, keeps uh, 19 goal over 20. And when faced, uh, and, um, when faced on right shooter, keeps 28 goal out of 40. So, if you compare, let's try to compare the performance of the two keepers when they face a left shooter. And we can see it clearly that by percentage, uh, the keeper B, Breras, 
um, stops more uh, stops more attempts than the keeper A. Next, we go to the uh, to the right shooter, and again we see that keeper B on percentage stops more attempt than the goalkeeper A. Then we do the total, we sum. And if we sum, we see that the keeper A stops 13 attempts over 60, and the keeper B stops 11 attempts over 60. So if the shooter is left or right, goalkeeper B, Breras, is better. But if we don't know the foot of the shooter, goalkeeper A, Aristoteles, is better. So apparently, we can say, who cares about this? It's just a statistical curiosity. But let's try another example. And if I want to, to, to make you emotion, there's nothing better only three things can emotion the human, the human being in, in these times. Uh, the first one I will not mention. The second one is uh, food, and the third one, of course, is personal um, is, uh, is the personal well-being. So let's ask ourselves if the treatment that we are looking at is bad or good. Let's imagine that uh, some persons are treated by a drug and uh, uh, another uh, sample of people is, as usual, treated with a placebo. And we, uh, and we monitor, and we monitor separately, we monitor separately this, uh, 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 monitor separately this, uh, this, the outcome of the experiment. And we see, Let's look at the group of men. If we treat a group of men for this, uh, with this medicine, this treatment for uh, recovering after a stroke, after a heart attack, we see that 93%, uh, so 81 over 87 men recover being administered the drug. That, uh, uh, Comparison in the in the control group, let's say uh, the one that were given the placebo, only eighty seven percent recovered. If we look at women, we see that seventy three percent of the women recovered, while sixty nine percent in the that uh, re that received the placebo recovered. If we sum them. Okay, we see 78% of the total people recovered after being administered the drug, but 83% of the group being given the placebo recovered. So this drug is good for you if you're a man, is good for you if you're a woman, is bad for you if you're a man or a woman. Clearly, this doesn't make sense. And I'm quite sure that uh, being in a data science classroom, many of you know the reason why this happens. This is a well-known example of the Simpson paradox. Data can show different trends if interpolated by group or in a single bunch, simply due to different weights of the population. So, if we interpolate the, uh, the, the effect of a given behavior over single individuals or over group, we see a negative trend like here for, uh, for Marge Barton or, uh, or, uh, or Maggie Simpson. But if we interpolate as a whole, we see the contrary effect. Now, pretty sure, as I said, that you know the reason why this happens. The question is, of course, which of the two should I consider? 
which is the correct answer. Is this treatment bad or good? Well, we can, we can try to, to, to reason about this by trying to understand the mechanism that uh, gave rise to the data, by understanding in which way data were generated. So let's try to understand what is the difference between women and men. One of the difference that we know as a physician is that estrogen have got a negative effect on recovery. So, oh, sorry. Um, estrogen has a negative effect on recovery. So women recover in a different way with respect to men. And as we can see from data, if you remember, women are more likely to take the prescribed drug with respect to men. If we, if we look at the data, uh, the, mm, the vast majority of women did actually take the drug and the vast majority of men did not actually take the drug. This is a typical effect that, that, uh, that happens in medicine. Women are more prone to follow what the doctor tells them. So the reason why the drug appears to be harmful overall is that if we select a person at random, it is more likely to be a woman than a man. And if we uh, imagine to look, uh, to look at, the, at the, a sort of a, a causal diagram, we see that gender is a common cause for both drug and recovery in the sense that if I am a woman, I will recover in a different way with respect to the fact that I am a man and I will take the drug in a different percentage if I, uh, that if I'm a man. So in this case, the correct, the, correct, uh, um, the correct pathway to follow is the separated one. I should consider the result of the segregated groups and not of the, um, of the total overall, because if I consider the total, I would be confounded by a common cause. We will see um, more clearly in the, in, the, in the forthcoming, but in this case, it's better to, 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 to watch for the segregated data and take care only in this case. Let's look at this other treatment. Even here, I've got a drug that is designed to make me recover from, uh, from a heart attack, but here the groups are different because the other in, uh, in the column, you see the blood pressure of the patients after administrating the drug, I measure the blood pressure of the patient and I divide it into groups, low blood pressure, high blood, blood pressure as measured after the treatment. If you look at the data, they are clearly exactly the same data that I shown you before. The same numbers, the same percentage, the same all. So what is the difference? And should I take for the segregated data or should I take for the global data? Well, in this case, in this case, I should consider even here the mechanism that generated the data. And remember the fact that blood pressure was measured after the treatment. So the reduction of the blood pressure is probably the effect that we seek, the effect by which the drug works in helping recover from heart attack. In fact, administrating uh, a drug to a human being has a bunch of effects. 
Remember that every chemical that you insert into your body have a multiple effect on your body. For example, uh, on my desk here, I have a chemical that if taken in, a, um, in an adequate quantity would for sure kill yourself. For sure, you have no way of escape. And this incredibly harmful chemical is water. If I drink, if I drink uh, 10 or 15 liters of water in a single day, I will fall into, into hyponatremia. The, the concentration of sodium in my blood uh, would lower, would lower up to a point that I will develop an encephalite, an encephalitis, uh, an inflammation disease of the cerebellum, of the, of the cerebellar membranes, and I would die. So uh, every, um, every chemical has got a series of effects, every chemical has got a series of mechanisms. And we infer that the mechanism by which the drug works in this case is probably reduction of blood pressure. But the very important word here is the blood pressure was measured after. In one case, we were looking at the gender. In one case, we were looking at the blood pressure. So one before, the gender usually happens, uh, can be recognized easily when, you, uh, when you're born, when you're born, and uh, it determines, it, 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 it uh, determines a lot of, of things when you grow up. But uh, I'm quite sure that a medicine cannot turn a man into a woman or vice versa. So in the former case, uh, in the case of the blood pressure, the mechanism was drug pressure decrease recovery. In the first case, the gender, we had a common cause. In the second case, we have a mechanism. So we distinguish, we distinguish the two cases because we began to speak of cause and effect. Uh, the numbers were actually the very same. I told you before uh, that uh, trying to understand a causal diagram, a causal, um, a causal diagram of, of uh, our situation in the first case, we will see gender as a common cause. So this diagram comes from our assumption that drug cannot modify gender, but nevertheless, there is no way to prove this assumption from data. And this is the message of this very first beginning. Data by alone can't work if what we see are data from a real experimental world. Data by alone can only work, and here I, I just, I, I, I interrupt myself, uh, data from the real world are aggregated in objects, uh, in objects like um, mechanisms, like pumps, like hearts, like men and women. Um, in order for the data to be the only thing that you need, you need a completely symmetrical situation, a situation made of equation. This is equal to that. So what is this symmetrical situation? Well, if you know the position and the velocity, the position and the momenta of all the particle of the system that you are studying and all the particles, the velocity and momentum of all the systems of the environment in which your system is modifying itself, then you need not to, uh, you need not causation. You just need data and you just need Newton's equations. But unfortunately, uh, we're speaking about uh, millions of, may of uh, billions of billions of uh, particles. So it's a little bit anti-economic. And uh, um, in in other in the in the in the real world, you have you have to to deal with uh, with cause and effect. 
you have to uh, divide when you when you have to divide your the system that you're studying into apparatus into mechanism you have an intrinsic asymmetry uh, if i uh, with my car bunch into a mosquito well uh, the mass of my car is quite more than the mass of the mosquito. So the velocity of my car causes the mosquito to splash. And when we're dealing uh, with this kind of objects, it's quite more convenient, it's quite more useful to reason in terms of cause and effect. And this is what we usually do when we design an experiment. So I stop a little bit uh, for asking you, uh, let's try to, uh, to go back to the first experiment. Let's try to go back to the first experiment. And I would like to, um, to ask you the first or the second, there's no, there's, this is not important. And I would like to ask you uh, if you would design an experiment like this and where is the flow with this kind of experiment? What is the defect and the problem with this kind of with this kind of 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 experiment? If some of you wants to uh, try to 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 say to to raise the hand and try to understand where is the problem. I can give you a hint if you want. I can see, for example, a control group and a, and a, and a prescribed group that are not equal and that are not randomized. When we design for an experiment, one of the first thing that, that we do is to, uh, is to assure, assure ourselves that uh, we have a, uh, a random sample of people to which we prescribe the drug and to which we prescribe the placebo. And hopefully they don't know if they are getting the drug or the placebo. We're trying to do a random, con a randomized controlled trial clinical experiment. So we take a group of people, we divide them in a half at random. We prescribe first treatment to the group A and placebo to the drug B. Then we wait for a little time and then we prescribe drug to group B, to group B and placebo to group A, and then we go on. Of course, this can be done in several situations, but cannot be done in other situations. For example, uh, if we want to understand if smoking causes cancer, it's not ethical to take a group and force them to smoke for five years and take another group and, and uh, try to let them away from smoking for five years. It's rather unethical. In other situation, if we would like to understand if and how much CO2, carbon dioxide, causes global warming, it would be uh, rather dumb and uh, rather costly to, uh, uh, to spread CO2 in, in big quantities all over the world and let's see if the temperature raises. But uh, Nevertheless, it's an important question to be addressed. On the other side, if we would like to understand uh, if and in how to, uh, to which extent uh, COVID policies of all the governments all around the world were effective or not, we cannot, uh, we cannot set the clock in direction backwards uh, in, in, uh, in rewind mode go in the past of two years and uh, uh, let's change and let's, let's experiment and play 
with the different policies. But uh, it would be wonderful, Is, wouldn't it? So what we are trying to learn and what we will uh, learn in this series of lecture is actually how to do it exact it's how to deal with observational experiments trying to modify them into interventional experiment into random controlled uh, random uh, controlled trial clinical experiment and to do this, we need a little bit of philosophy. We, lead, we will need a bunch of mathematics, of graph theory, and of probability. We will not need, we will need only to make thing, things easier, but we will not need um, an assumption that is usually assumed when we deal and when we face with difficult tasks in mathematics, in physics, in graph theory, we will not need the word linear. If we are able to, um, to build a causal model, that is a model of cause and effect, and if we are, gi and if we are given a sufficient data set, a sufficiently accurate data set, we can do it. And in some, um, sometimes, if we are given, if we build a causal model, and if we are given an insufficient data set, we can do it the same. And uh, uh, the fact that the data are in linear relationships one to another would not help us. So let's try to, uh, to begin and to understand how it does work. Again, uh, I hope that uh, up to now everything is clear, and I, I, I repeat you: if there is, there are questions, if there are observation of of uh, of any kind, please feel free to 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 digit into the question and answer, and uh, to to raise your hand and let me know. So let's go on. with the presentation. And I would like to, to okay. okay, no, no. Okay, so we try to understand what do we need for a mathematical theory of causation? And we will need four things. The first one is of course, a working definition of causation. We all came from mathematics uh, and so, we need to we need some definition we need some axioms we need something to start from then as a second thing we need a method by which formally articulate causal models in a formal way so in a mod, in a way made of theorems of lemmas of things that once demonstrated can be believed with uh, with uh, no other effort and we will do it by graph theory and by uh, Markovian uh, chain theory. Uh, as a third fact, we need a method to combine the model and the data. And this is really the funny part, the part in which we will uh, introduce the, uh, the new mathematical formalism that is the, the core and the workhorse of the mathematical theory of causation. So, uh, and we will uh, briefly see what it is. Uh, but, uh, and for, um, basically the method to combine the model and the data is the ability to intervene into the data, to take uh, the, the, mo the causal model and to uh, infer the effect of modification into that causal model. And we, will, uh, and we will try to understand how we can express the effect of modification in terms of the, uh, of the 
data given by the observations. And fourth, another method that I swear is the last, to translate the questions that are given usually in natural language into calculation. Because um, after being able to intervene into the model, we could really uh, ask a series of interesting questions to our model. We can ask questions like the one loved by Randall Monroe, what if, what if the earth would stop but the, 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 the atmosphere would continue to go, to go on in its own velocity? We can uh, ask for questions, for hypothetical questions and for counterfactual questions. That is, we can not only ask what if, but even what if not. What would have been if this thing in the past didn't happen? If I didn't smoke for the last 10 years, would I get, would I get the same uh, lung cancer? If Zidane had not eat Materazzi by his head, had the Italy, would have Italy won the uh, 2006 World Championship of Football? These kind of questions, in natural language can be asked, can be uh, answered for in, this, in these models and in this framework. Of course, in this model and in this framework. And the question is very, uh, is very important because uh, this is the way in which we build up our knowledge. So for those of you that are interested in artificial intelligence, and in deep learning, remember that the question why is the question that is the most beloved by the optimal learner, the children. Uh, the children asks, ask why, 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 why is an recursive question and this is the question by which we learn by establishing a mechanism of cause and effect. So being able to deal with deep learning, with artificial uh, intelligence in terms of cause and effect would be my modest opinion. Well, <laughs> really a way not only to, to, to do better things with artificial intelligence, but to understand what happens in the artificial intelligence uh, engines. Uh, many of you, of course, know that uh, three or four years ago, AlphaGo, a software, uh, were, was able to, uh, to defeat the world champion of Go, of Chinese uh, checkers, uh, that is a, Kore a South Korean named Lee Sidol. And uh, nowadays, computers beat easily world champions of checks, of, of uh, of, uh, of Go and of chess, but they are not able at the moment to write a book about how to play chess or Go. They are not able to deal with causal effect. If we ask to the machine, if we will look at the machine trying to understand why it's able to beat Lissidol, I think we are not in, at the, in this moment at the very position to do it with certainty. So let's try to go. And we start with the point one, a working definition of causation. And we turn to a philosopher of an ancient time, David Hume. Uh, we were speaking well, before with, uh, with Dino, with Dino Pedreschi, the fact that uh, many, many interesting things happened in Edinburgh at the, at the half of the, of the 18th century. In, 19, uh, in, in 1749, uh, David Hume published a book entitled An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, uh, 1748, I'm sorry. And uh, in this book, he gave this definition of causality. We may define a cause to be an object followed by another where if the first object had not been, the second never had existed. 
the definition of causality uh, was uh, in the head of Hume a sort of falsification. If I remove from the world in the past, hypothetically, the presumed cause of the effect, then the effect should disappear. If I can intervene on that cause and only on that cause, removing it, I will see that the effect disappears. This is the first important thing to note in Hume sentences. The fact that he's acting hypothetically, asking himself, what could have uh, happened in the past? If I go into the past and remove the, the cause, what, uh, how uh, can, and how will the future have been developed? This is the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that there were a time when philosophers were able to express themselves clearly. We are uh, slowly recovering these aspects, but uh, uh, in subsequent times, this did not happen every day. So we will assume this definition of causality. If I remove the cause, the effect will not manifest, itself, if I, uh, if I uh, modify the cause, I would like the effect to change accordingly. As a second model, uh, as a second model, uh, second part, we will speak about the model. And as I was previously saying, we will speak about graphs, about directed acyclic graphs. Both, um, both these, uh, these two terms are very important. Directed because we need a cause and an effect. We need a direction. As I said, we are assuming that uh, there, are, there, is, there are entities that cause other entities and that these entities subsequently cause other entities. It is not prohibited uh, in these graphs, uh, of course, to uh, to insert bidirected edges. Usually, uh, when we speak about statistics, and uh, I, I, I have to, to explain a little bit the graph that you are looking for. Usually, when we speak about statistics, we speak about uh, public health, about well being, about uh, rare and uh, uh, but lethal diseases, about uh, uh, common and uh, Lethal diseases. Uh, being in the in the Master Chef era, I chosen to speak about uh, about food and about cuisine and about uh, and about preparing food. So, uh, in this model, in this model, I can you, you can see a, a possible, a plausible model of how a restaurant works. There is a chef that uh, buys. Uh, the goods from the grocer, from the from the uh, from the sellers of of meat, of vegetables, of fish, and all these kinds. So the chef causes the grocer. He chooses the grocer. The chef chooses the recipe and chooses the ingredients together with the grocer, of course. But recipe and the ingredients. Uh, are in these particular graphs held independent. As a matter of fact, this is not at all true in a, in a true restaurant. Uh, you could think about insert a bidirected edge, a bidirected edge that goes from recipe to ingredients. Because if I am in shortage of, let's say, uh, spaghetti, I can. I can't cook spaghetti alla carbonara, but I can cook uh, bucatini alla carbonara or uh, other kind of pasta alla carbonara. And uh, so, uh, and the same thing, if I, I have in mind a recipe, I will look uh, and I will, I, I will 
look for some ingredients that might enrich, that might uh, add something, that might add a spike to my recipe. If I, if I cook spaghetti carbonara, I may try to add uh, a little bit of zucchini in, uh, together, with, uh, together with bacon in order to give to, to make them a little bit less uh, a little bit less uh, fat or a little bit less uh, tasty uh, not to mention if i am in shortage of uh, of cream uh, i can do carbonara instead because carbonara do not require cream if you if you hear something someone preparing pasta la carbonara with cream please go to the um, to the nearest uh, police quarter and uh, and signal him to the authorities it's a crime so even if there is a bidirected edge i can still deal the most part of the time with these kinds of diagrams with this kind of models and now i can deal with them i can intervene by uh, mathematical procedures that allow me to modify one of the uh, to modify one of the um, of the actors one of the variables into the graph and as you know in graph theory in markov graph theory if i uh, if i assume that the parents of uh, the variable in on which I am intervening. If I know all the parents of the variable I am intervening on, a direct intervention into uh, into this variable, into the variable ingredients, is equivalent to the uh, operation of blocking all the way that all the parents that are directly entering into the uh, into the uh, into the ingredient so uh, this is what we are going to do we are going to look for mathematical operations that are that uh, that render us able to block these paths to block uh, and to uh, and to choose the values of the of the um, of the variable or of the variables we want to modify and to simulate a sort of experiment to and um, to 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 obtain our new uh, our new values in this sense uh, this is exactly what i was what i was telling you about intervening on the ingredients is perfectly equivalent to consider a, a reduced graph in which the parent the parents of the uh, of the variable that i'm looking at are simply removed and are out of the game so now uh, before um, before we do uh, a little stop i will um, i will deal with two pitfalls of the directed graphs. Uh, it, mm, when we try to, to, to represent reality by directed graphs, by models, we have to be aware of two pitfalls. The first one is, of course, the spurious correlation. Uh, we all know that if we look at the, um, at the, at the at, at data, there is a, a strong correlation between the quantity of ice creams that are sold during that the time and the quantity of wood fires that uh, burn out woods of pines or, or oaks or other sort of, of uh, trees in the landscape. Uh, are these things causally related? Maybe there is a, a harmful drug into the ice cream that makes people develop pyromania or maybe after uh, having burnt having set up a fire uh, the maniac goes to the ice cream shops and order uh, hazelnuts and yogurt ice cream of course not of course there is a common cause the summer 
summer is a common cause of both raising the ice cream so cell and of wood fires. And this is a pitfall we are currently aware. There is a pitfall we are not um, equally aware and is the pitfall of coincidence versus synergy. Consider the graph on your left. Uh, if we, um, there, mm, you can become a very famous Hollywood actor in two ways. You can be extremely beautiful, you can be a great actor, or you can be both. So if we uh, condition, if we, uh, if we try to calculate a probability conditioned on the group of Hollywood actor that is controlling for the variable Hollywood actor, we are doing a mistake. Why? Because in this group, we will uh, find persons that are incredibly beautiful and incredibly good as actors, like, for example, Johnny Depp. We will find uh, very, very good actors, like, for example, Danny DeVito, which has not been gifted by gods of, let's say, a um, wonderful physical aspect. I, I hope that all we agree on this. And we will meet extremely beautiful actors with very little actorship ability, like, for example, Keanu Reeves, that according to um, comedy, critic, comedy critics, uh, Jess Grindkopf, seems always um, committed, committed to trying to remember the next part of the score instead of actually acting. But you won't find in this, uh, in this group of Hollywood actory, actors the vast majority of the people, plain people that can't act, ordinary people that can't act, and they are the vast majority. And in this graph, you see an effect of or. You can be beautiful or very good as an actor to, uh, to, to, to reach Hollywood starship, but uh, conditioning on the fact of being an Hollywood actor will not help your statistical inquiry. But not all the colliders are of the form uh, or there is the form and uh, the form that, in, that requires synergy uh, in order to be able uh, to, to be able for your car to, uh, to, to enable your car to, um, to bring you somewhere, your car has to have an engine and has to have fuel. If you've got only the engine, you won't move. If you got, if you got only fuel, well, uh, you can hit yourself, but you won't move. And this is a different effect. All this to say a very simple thing, but in, very simple, but to clarify that in that often uh, when we deal with mathematics and when we begin to dig and to, to express ourselves in terms of formulas, in terms of equation, we have, uh, we are prone to the risk of forgetting elementary logic or elementary knowledge of the world. I don't know for what you are concerned. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the kind of th person that often falls into this kind of mistakes. There's a very simple uh, meaning. It's not easy nor safe to deal with causal models only by intuition we need to calculate. So at the end of this uh, first uh, simple, I, I hope simple and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think not too long introduction, uh, the, the, the aim was to, uh, to convince yourself that in order to do correct statistical analysis, sometimes data are not enough. We need the data, we need the model, we need to take 
our intuition and to lock it down into the cloaker room and to use only calculation and uh, the calculation calculation set uh, set up according to uh, to a to a ground scientific background now if you uh, agree uh, we will stop for five minutes for a uh, 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 a coffee and uh, and water and uh, other things pose and we will see here in five minutes and we will begin to to dig in uh, with mathematics with probability with formulas and all these kind of things that we nerd with uh, uh, with eyeglasses laugh and we will try to understand how to uh, to torture the data in order to make them confess if they're causal or not so see you in five minutes uh, let's do six thanks grazie marco <laughs> grazie okay Welcome, welcome to you all. And uh, uh, um, now we're going to um, to dig further and to, to into the mathematical theory of causation. And in this first part, in this first uh, first lecture, we will uh, resume some. Uh, elementary uh, results in probability and uh, some terminology in graph theory. And we will begin to see what we uh, actually mean by, by causation. I know this is uh, unfortunately the, the boring part, but we need this definition in order to be certain of the terminology we're going to, uh, we're going to, 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 to use. So, uh, Again, um, uh, I will uh, at during the during the, the the lectures and at the end of the lectures uh, suggest um, suggest you books and prepare a selected uh, papers and uh, um, papers and uh, uh, reports in order to to uh, to be able to to study and to follow and to. Uh, to test, we will we will test. We will uh, we will play with uh, with uh, codes and uh, and uh, and data sets in order to apply what we what we are uh, speaking about in the, from the from the next week on. But uh, um, um, there is a thing to remember, and is that these methods uh, are still in their infancy. They are uh, complete in a sense that uh, uh, it is now a mathematically well-grounded method. But uh, um, if you can imagine the first um, the definitive theorem about completeness of the calculation we're speaking about is, is of 2011. So uh, there is much research literature, there is not so much uh, review and uh, uh, divulgation literature. So it's easy to, uh, it, it happened to me for several, for a, for a long period, it's easy to drown into this, uh, into this mess. So uh, I followed to start quite quietly and slowly, and then we will, um, we will dig up deeper. So let's, uh, let's begin with, uh, with probability and let's try to, to say, to, to see what we are doing. Yes. Okay. This we already saw. Okay, so we will of course uh, um, point uh, with a capital letter uh, the variable 
and with uh, uh, a small letter, uh, the, uh, the event, the variable and the, the, the event is the value that the variable can take. For, uh, for example, um, uh, a football team can win or not win uh, a match, win, uh, draw or lose a match or uh, other kind of trivial things that I'm quite sure you, you, uh, you can deal uh, properly. Uh, the probability, we will, uh, we will point with P of A equal to A, the probability that the event A um, happens. And this is the marginal probability, the probability that a variable takes a single value. Uh, quite more interesting is the conditional probability. That is the probability that a single event ha A happens conditioned on the fact that another, not a preceding, another uh, event B happens. The conditional probability is uh, not other things that the joint probability, so the probability that both A and B happens, divided by the probability that B happens. And the conditional probability will be the uh, one of the workhorse of, uh, of, our, uh, of our methods. As, uh, as I was uh, saying before, we do not need uh, to say linear or other things. If we've got sufficient data, we can extract from this data a sufficient uh, a sufficient data set of conditional probabilities, and we will need only this and some uh, and uh, some smart way to, to to apply and to multiply and to divide them in order to see what happens. I remember some important properties of probability. The first one is the independence. Uh, we say that the variable A is independent on the variable B if the conditional probability of PA condon B is equal to PA. So this is independent. If uh, we look of the total probability for mutually exclusive events, events that can happen, for example, uh, I can uh, be alive or dead, but uh, there is not mm, there is not a meanwhile. I can win or lose a tennis match, but there is not a draw inside. I will uh, I can say that the probability that happens A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. Uh, and from this property comes the fact that for any two events, A and B, that are not uh, mutually exclusive, I can say that the probability, the marginal probability of A is equal to the, to the joint probability of A and B, plus the probability, the joint probability of A and not. B. This looks like, like a rather uh, trivial property, but uh, we will see in the future that uh, we will exploit. <laughs> uh, we will exploit um, quite a lot this, this trivial property. And from this trivial property, some very interesting properties uh, rise up. More generally, for any set of mutually exclusive event, B1, B2, and, B, and so forth, Bn, such, of that, such that exactly one of them must be true, we have that the marginal probability Pa is equal to the sum of all the joint probability connected to the event B. So, uh, the probability that I'm happy is equal to the probability that I'm happy uh, and my team won, plus the probability that I'm happy and my team made a draw, plus the probability that I'm happy and my team lost. 
So uh, we can always express a marginal probability in terms of uh, um, joint probability related to mutually exclusive events. Uh, why this property is useful? Because often we don't have uh, um, we don't have easily uh, the, the we don't have the the, the, the easily the, the the ability to say uh, to 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 define a total uh, a total uh, a total probability. Uh, it's a uh, Often we are um, more, um, uh, we can deal easily, uh, more easily, if we can imagine a series of joint events that can influence the, uh, the variable, uh, the variable that I'm that I'm looking for. Uh, it's generally easier to assess conditional probabilities. So, from the definition of conditional probability, it is also true that the marginal probability is uh, the conditional probability that I'm happy if my uh, if uh, if my uh, if my uh, my team wins times the probability that my team wins while the probability that I'm happy and my team wins is a rather uh, cloudy object, the probability that I'm happy if my team wins is something that I can often uh, that I can often esteem by means of direct misuration. I verify that my time that my team wins, and I ask myself, I am happy, I am set. And then I take the probability that my uh, that my um, that my team won, and I multiply uh, it. So I can um, express a marginal probability in terms of joint probability, and I can express joint probability in terms of conditional probability. That are the probability that we usually access experimentally by looking if a condition is verified, and then looking if uh, the, the, uh, the value that the other variable, variable took. So these, uh, these, these relations we will, will turn out to be quite useful. But uh, we arrive here to one of the main characters of the story, the bias theorem. Bias theorem is the... Uh, 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 in, in Italian, I would, I would say that is the uh, il congiuntivo della matematica, is, the, um, is a way to, uh, to deal with direct, direct reasoning and inverse reasoning, with direct observation and inverse observation. Uh, most of you know that the probability that my garden is wet if it rained is not equal to the probability that is rained if my garden is wet. And um, of course, uh, many things, many many things can my, make my garden wet. Maybe I, I turn the sprinkler the sprinklers on. Or, uh, or maybe uh, one of my neighbors that is actually uh, actually mad like a watermelon spread water all around. But uh, the, the wonderful power of the Bayes theorem is that from the probability that my garden is wet if it rained, I can, uh, I can recover the inverse probability. And we need only the definition of conditional probability. The joint probability of A and B is equal to the conditional probability of uh, this uh, of P conditioned on B times the probability of B, but also to the probability of B conditioned on A times the probability of A. And just by the symmetry of the joint probability, probability of A 
uh, and b is equal to the probability of b and a, I can uh, I can recover the uh, Bayes the Bayes theorem. Bayes theorem uh, states uh, the way in which I can recover the uh, inverse probability probability of a conditioned on b from the probability of b conditioned on a, and uh, and many many of the questions of the real world are usually given a uh, uh, p uh, p of b condition on a while uh, the um, while the uh, actual probability that i would like to know is the probability of a conditioned on b uh, if you um, the the the, um, the difficulty of the uh, the problems of the human being with distinguishing uh, th this two kind of probability uh, is uh, at the origin of many misunder misunderstandings in science in law and in other things uh, a, a very useful way to see the power of Bayes' theorem is to um, imagine this as little history uh, imagine that you've got a test for uh, for a very um, a very harmful disease. Let's say uh, let's say uh, HIV, uh, uh, immunodeficiency, human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS. Uh, you have a test that uh, a test in which you rely strongly. The test has no false positive. That is, if you have HIV, you are caught, you, you, you give a, a correct answer, you're given a correct answer. And if you are um, negative, it gives you a false positive. That is, it says you have got HIV if you are perfectly uh, fit in one, uh, one times over 1,000. So, one case over 1,000, you get a false, uh, a false positive diagnosis. HIV, as you say, happens, unfortunately, quite seldom. Only uh, one people uh, in, in, uh, in 10,000 is diagnostic with HIV. So if I uh, go and test myself, uh, if I go and test myself and receive a, uh, a positive answer, a positive, uh, my test turns out to be positive, should I really worry or better? Let's express this in terms of probability. What is the probability that I've got HIV? Is higher or lower than 50%? Is more, I'm more likely to have HIV or to have not HIV. This is uh, a question for you. If I will wait for one minute in order for you to try to, to give me your answer. And exactly, I'm watching the screen, I'm waiting. Okay, if, if someone gets the right answer, it will have a coffee offered from me. I'm quite sure that I, that I can do it because we, we, we won't meet physically. So it's, it, the, the coffee would arrive cold and nobody loves a cold coffee. Okay, the answer is that the probability is quite lower than 50% actually is about uh, a little a little more than 10% because uh, as i said before 
the uh, HIV is a ray, is a condition that happens seldom. So one over 10,000. And this is what you should consider. Uh, the fact is that uh, imagine 10,000 person that enter the diagnosis center and 10,000 get the test. There is only one person that has got really actually HIV. But the, my test gives false positive one time over 1,000 patient. So after the day, I've got one positive diagnosticized positive. And since I've got 10,000 person, I've got 10 person, one each thousand person that is diagnosticized uh, with a false positive. So one true positive, 10 false positives. So my, uh, the probability, the probability that I am that true positive in is one over 11, slightly less than 10%. So uh, Bayes' theorem helps us to calculate the conditional probability, helps us to, con to, to calculate the conditional probability when we are, when we are, uh, when we, when we are not able to calculate, uh, to calculate it. I, now I, I made a little mess with the screen, so I don't know if you see properly the, uh, the screen. Yes, we do. Oh, oh, wonderful. We are arriving at the, at the, at the correct. Okay, so what does, uh, where does the, the Bayes theorem enters in, into play? Uh, as I said, because it helps us to calculate conditional properties, conditional probabilities with ease. Uh, some, uh, some person and some authors trend, tend to see the Bayes theorem as a sort of cause and effect relationship. They say, uh, yes, the, the illness comes before. The illness causes the uh, test partially because uh, it's the fact that I am ill or not causes the result of the test. So uh, uh, the easier part to calculate is the correct cause and effect relationship, but this is not actually true. The Bayes theorem uh, relates to things, one of, the, uh, of which is easy to calculate while the other may be not. Uh, the original version of Bayes theorem dealt with billiard balls and, uh, and billiards. So, since the billiard is already there, and since balls are thrown on the billiard that is already there, one is led, some, someone can be led to think that the billiard is the cause and the balls are the effect. And uh, it works in that, uh, in that uh, situation only by chance. Uh, from if I, I can draw one example, I, I, you will see that I will draw many examples from football. From football, in football, it's quite easier to calculate the probability that if, is it, if it is goal, uh, then you can calculate the probability of the action. What is the probability of a given action if it was a goal? So you calculate the probability of that the action was a corner kick, a free kick, a penalty kick. If it's a goal, you start from a certain assertion. It was a goal. You can easily distinguish a goal from, um, from a not a goal, unless you are a, a referee uh, uh, watching a world championship, watching England, Germany at world championship before the VAR era. So you can distinguish easily a goal and you can calculate the probability of an addition of an action of a possession condition on the goal. 
it's quite more difficult to calculate the probability that it will be a goal given that you are playing a, uh, a given action. But actually, the action causes the goal, is not the goal that causes the action. For a mere question of time, the action comes before the, uh, the outcome of the, of the action. So uh, Bayes' theorem is not uh, deals not with causality, deals with the fact that I am trying to calculate a, a hard to obtain conditional probability in terms of easier to obtain conditional probability. And we will see that um, those marginal probabilities that we see, PA and PB, are, us are usually inferred are usually hypothesized when they can't be measured by means of priors, by means of imaging uh, a necessary, necessary uh, auxiliary condition for them to be verified, just like, if you remember, we did in previous, in previous slides for uh, trying to define uh, marginal probabilities in terms of conditional probability. Now, Let's dig a little bit into what is, uh, uh, what, how can we uh, look at causality? Let's say that we are given two, uh, uh, two variables, temperature and altitude. Uh, and we ask ourselves if it's the temperature that causes the altitude or if it's the altitude that causes the temperature. So we can uh, hypothesize two mechanisms. In the first one, uh, the altitude causes the temperature, the one on your left. So I can imagine to draw a graph, altitude and an arrow that points from altitude to temperature and uh, the relation between altitude and uh, temperature is given by a mechanism that I can express with a conditional probability, probability of temperature given altitude. But I can uh, mathematically do the, do the same thing on the contrary. Uh, so uh, I can express this uh, imagining that temperature causes altitude and so uh, draw uh, uh, an object, a variable, temperature, and a, an arrow pointing from temperature to altitude. And the, 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 mechanism, the mechanism pointing from temperature to altitude is my mechanism. No, from an empirical point of view, we can uh, deal with these things experimentally. I can I can intervene, I can uh, vary my altitude by go on the mountain, by go on the sea, and only uh, my altitude, I can try to, uh, to vary my altitude and only my altitude at uh, parity of other, all other conditions. The best things to do would be to, um, to jump in, in a Mongol sphere, in, a, in an air balloon, and raise my altitude while my longitude and my latitude are the same, and I measure the temperature. And I see that actually the higher I go, the lower the temperature goes. On the same thing, on the same, uh, so I vary my altitude and only my altitude, and I see that temperature varies. On the other side, I can vary my temperature. I can, uh, I can stay into my air balloon and uh, uh, pour hot water. And uh, look if my uh, balloon raise, rises. No. I can pour ice or ice water and the balloon don't rise. Temperature don't cause attitude. From a mathematical point of view, how could you afford this problem? Well, uh, Imagine that you want to find a function, a mathematical function that allows you uh, to fit temperature 
as a function of altitude. I'm quite sure, and actually I can assure you that you can find easily a function that works quite well. It's sort of a slight, uh, of an almost linear relations, relation that say that the higher you go, the lower the temperature goes, and it goes with the density, of course, of air. The higher you go, the lower the density of the air around you uh, uh, becomes, and so the lower the temperature. But I would like you to, uh, to uh, express a function that, uh, can you imagine a function that gives you the altitude at which you are by means of the temperature of the of the place in which you are if you can do it you would be really a, a godsend it can't be done uh, so uh, the uh, the existence of a relation in a direction but not in another direction is one of the main of the main uh, of the main um, uh, workhorse that we will we'll be using, we can uh, imagine a function that relates altitude to temperature, but not temperature to altitude. Uh, this idea is called usually the uh, effect of intervention, and it states this: our intuition can be rephrased. Uh, in this way, if A causes T is the correct causal structure, is the correct direction, then it is in principle possible to perform a localized intervention on A, that is on A and only on A, varying tuning A and only A, and changing the probability of A without changing the probability of T conditioned A. And PA and PT conditioned on A are autonomous, modular and invariant mechanisms, mechanisms or objects in the world. That is, you imagine to partition the world into object the variables and mechanisms, the arrows pointing from one variable to another, and you infer that one causes the other. If you can infer, uh, if you can imagine to perform a localized intervention on one of the variables and have an effect of the, uh, uh, of the other. But you can imagine to change, to change the value of the variable without changing the mechanism. Uh, if the if uh, the my um, uh, the, the the this means that you can change the altitude without changing the function that relates the altitude to the temperature. The function remains the same, of course. If you change the altitude, the different value of the input gives you a different output, but the mechanism is exactly the same. I used this word imagine, imagine, because most part of the time we will imagine that models, we will use our knowledge of the world to draw DAG directed acyclic graphs, graphs that point. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that point uh, from one arrow to another. We will imagine them, and then with our calculation, we will see if they are feasible, if they are acceptable and coherent with our data, or, they, if, or if they are not. We can falsify them by means of probability, by means of Markov properties, by means of... Uh, of various mathematical properties. But first, we have to imagine, we have to work. We have to ask ourselves, mm, what are the actors in this kind of process? And then, after then, and only after then, we can do calculations. So 
since we are going to use directed acyclic graphs, let's see and, uh, and, uh, and resume some terminology in directed acyclic graphs. Let's take our variable x. If I have a variable of x, all the, uh, all the variables that have an arrow pointing from themselves into x are directly into x are uh, named parent of x. All the variables that uh, have an arrow pointing into themselves, starting from x, are with an enormous use of fantasy child of x. Uh, with the same uh, familiar uh, way of, of, uh, of, uh, of expressing, I think that the, 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 main, uh, the main first tradition of uh, directed acyclic graphs was Italian because of the huge amount of terms derived from the family. The family was very important for me, it's evident. Um, we may see that every, uh, every variable that points, that point into, um, into, parent, into a parent of X is an ancestor of X and every uh, variables Every variable that have an arrow pointing into herself, descending from a child of X, is a descendant of X. Why this terminology is important? Because here we're going to exploit a fundamental property uh, that is the property we will always referring and we will be always turning on uh, when uh, when going uh, when going. In, into actual calculation, into actual demonstration, this formula that I'm going to show you will always appear, uh, or almost always. So if you try to understand, when you try to understand how a demonstration works on how to do a calculation, look always for this formula. That is the so-called recursive decomposition of Bayesian network. Imagine that you have got, uh, that you have got a, um, a data set with a joint probability. And uh, you have the joint probability. There is probability that variable one has got value x1, variable two has got value x2, and so on and so forth. So on the left, you have the joint probability. If the, um, if the graph, if the graph that you uh, traced, uh, the, the, mech, the model, the causal model that you trace is correct, then you will uh, see, realize the so-called conditional independence. That is, the, the joint probability, uh, simply applying the, uh, the properties that we saw before, is given by the product of all of the conditional probability of every variable conditioned on the value of the parent variable, this for all the variables of the graph. So imagine, for example, that I've got this kind of graph that I am drawing with my analogical device uh, here on, on my desk. I have tr three variables, X, Y, and Z, and connected with, with arrows. So I can always say that the probability of, uh, of my graph is, even this, this gives, I think, a little bit of suspense. And thanks to the great amount of technology that I can access, this, this uh, forces you to look and to, and to do something 
a little bit different. You see, I have a graph in which X points on towards Y and Z and Y points toward Z. The joint probability of this graph is simple. It is given by the probability of X that has got no ancestors and no parents, so is simply independent on all. And so if it's in the, independent on everything, the pro, it's just its probability is just the marginal probability times the probability of Y conditioned on X, his only, his only, uh, his only parent, times the probability of Z conditioned on X and Y that are his two parents. So this formula gives us, uh, gives us a, a, a huge help in assessing uh, in principle uh, if our uh, if our um, if our graph if our, if our causal model is correct or not if it respects it, the the joint probability that we access from data from experiments do respect the conditional independence well i uh, i decomposed this i i i was able to imagine a um um, division of the world, a partition of the world that works. And so I can make quantitative reasoning on that model. If it doesn't work, I have to look for another model because I know from the start that my model is wrong. And uh, so this, uh, this property will be used for both purposes to verify or better to falsify <laughs> to falsify the um, the model and to uh, and to operate on the model in order to be able to uh, to uh, to do causal intervention in order to uh, to do uh, to arrive to uh, infer uh, causal quantities in order to say how much this influences that, how much this modification influences that. And uh, in, this, in this way, we will, uh, we will arrive uh, to, um, we will be became able to do our, uh, our calculation. And, uh, I'm so uh, with these first uh, with these first uh, ingredients, we are uh, we are now able to um, to face uh, to face our problem. And uh, our problem is uh, uh, will be tackled on from the from the uh, next lecture, and uh, will be based on the construction of a virtual operator that is the oper the so called operator do that will allow us to do uh, to do uh, to do a, a, a bunch. Of things, and will allow to uh, to define in uh, to define in a very uh, in a very strict and uh, and meaningful way if x causes y, and here I will show. What is this uh, relation? And I will show in, uh, in at this at the moment. I will show just uh, just the just the relation, and this relation this relation uh, 
makes me is will be the uh, the main the main relation that we will use in order to uh, in order to to uh, to the in order to to be able to say if x causes y uh, the probability that y happens if i do x is more than the probability that y happens if x is verified the um, uh, the um, The main problem here will be from now on how to express this do because uh, it's a little bit unfair to insert a verb into the expression for a probability and uh, we will see in the next uh, lectures how and when we can express a probability a do probability in terms only of conditional probabilities this would will be the aim of our efforts we want to express the probability of y if i do x the effect of an action in terms of conditional probability of what happens in terms of prob probability of seeing y if and when a b YDC happens and how to combine them in order to uh, to be able to do our calculations so i repeat and by ending our effort from now on will be to understand how to shape how to transform that do into a mathematical expression and we will see how to do it when we can do it and uh, which kind of experiments, which kind of questions can be shaped once we are able to answer, to uh, answer, once we are able to translate a verbal expression into a mathematical expression. Then I think it's time to stop, but before stopping, I would like to hear from you if there are questions, comments, or uh, any other kind of observations. Maybe Marco, hi, I'm Luca. Hello. Uh, um, it, it's everything is clear to me, but uh, if there are some material or some books that you may suggest to to, to read during this course, it would be great. Absol absolutely. Well, um, uh, I would uh, um, uh, I would like to 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 share uh, books and and uh, and papers with you. So, I um, as as I, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's uh, still a discipline in his in his infancy, but. Uh, um I, I I will prepare and I'm I'm uh, I'm sharing I will share some uh, uh, some papers and some and some uh, uh, technical technical materials in order to uh, to to dive into but the best book to begin uh, I personally, I do understand something only when I'm able to calculate it. And as data scientists, probably <laughs> this is the, uh, the, 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 the correct approach for every one of us. So um, the best book in this sense is, the one, is this one that I will, uh, that I will um, point even in the, in the, now in the, in the comments. Uh, causal inference. In statistics, by um, by Judea Pearl. Judea Pearl is, by the way, the um, the developer of the main of um, many of the concepts that we will bump on, and Madeline Glimur and Nicholas Jewell. And uh, then, 
uh, the, uh, the Bible of Causality uh, by Judea Pearl. That is a very interesting book that I do not recommend for the beginning uh, because uh, it was written 10 years ago. Uh, it is for a first letter, for a first approach, probably redundant. And Judea Pearl is a great scientist, but probably not a great uh, writer of science. And actually, um, some parts of the books are really at a level of comprehension, uh, that level of comprehension that when you understand something, then you read it on the Pearl and you made it a mess again. So uh, it is nevertheless the more, uh, the more complete, um, uh, the more complete not up to now book on the subject and it is it deserves to be uh, to be given and then uh, the book uh, by uh, by Janzing and Peters and Scholkopf uh, okay that is called elements of causal inference Causality, okay. That is uh, uh, much more on, um, on functional models than on graphical models, but it's quite clear in the mathematical part. And uh, um, the, best, the best thing to do with, would be to read, uh, um, to read selected papers uh, and the... Uh, um, now I'm not uh, not sure how to share the papers that I've got here in, in here in my in my in my um, folders, but I will send uh, I will send you and to the administrator and uh, uh, and in order to share with the, with the, with the, all the students, uh, there are uh, limited numbers of papers that are both clear. And uh, uh, that can be uh, that can be understood, uh, and uh, I will I will share them with the uh, with you and all the students. Let just uh, I'm not I'm not uh, attempting to append here because I I think I'm not able to do this, uh, but uh, I will do it in a really really briefly. Okay. Grazie, Marco. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If uh, I hope this first lecture has been not too boring because there were probably introductory and elementary concepts, but they are important uh, in order to, to go on. To, I, was, uh, I, I needed to be sure that we all were new where we were, were starting for. So if there aren't any questions, if any more questions, uh, thank you very much for for understanding for for listening i i hope for understanding if not it's it's my fault no doubt uh and of your former teachers because i think you all are graduating data science and uh, let's see you on friday uh, 9 a.m uh, for the next lecture thank you very much and see you on friday grazie marco goodbye Bye.